Hey, good morning. Uh, welcome to the Sunday morning Genesis Church service and prime example of a wild pastor's kid. So he's been energetic. So if he's up moving around and Watusian across the table, I apologize. And hope y'all had a great week. Um, we're having this remote service this morning because I'm going to have to head to the airport after this for work. And um, but just a uh, giving some time for folks to come in and join us and y'all as you get on here let us know you out there give us a shout out good morning or amen or something and or we'd rather see the poodle something along those lines anyway hope you've had a wonderful week and gonna go ahead and we're gonna get started with a word of prayer here heavenly father we come to you in prayer Father, lifting up everyone in the Genesis Church family, everyone that's listening to this, everyone that will listen to this. And Father, all the people there lifting up, lift up everyone on our prayer list. Father, there's so many folks on there. They're dealing with grief and physical and spiritual illnesses, Father, and mental illness, and financial illnesses and struggles. Father, there's so many struggles, but we know the answer for all of them. You, you are stronger in each struggle there is, Father, in this world. Because Jesus has overcome the world. And Father, as we come to you in message, just I pray, Father, your words be heard, not mine. This world needs more of you in it. And let the words go to our hearts. And Father, let our hearts go out into this world like lanterns, bright lanterns out into a dark world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, y'all just got a few announcements here. And we want to say, uh, um, push your microphone or closer to your face. There you go. See if that'll okay. help. How about that, y'all? We're That's trying better. to do a little amplifier thingy, and um, I'm not real good at sign language, so. And so, y'all, prayer list. If there's anyone that you want us to pray for, and please give us updates on people that you ask us to pray for, because it is such a wonderful feeling to get an update. On someone that we've been praying for to let us know if they're better or if we need to pray for them in some other way and whether it's a honest service or you can message me um, please let us know if there is someone new that you'd like for us to pray for please put it in the comments or message me and I'll be glad to pray with them and pray for them and y'all anybody that has prayed and asked about my sister-in-law Jennifer Stanley she is feeling better and thankfully did not need surgery. So just want to thank everyone for checking in on Jennifer and seeing how she's doing. And we just ask that you continue to lift up Miss Prather Brock and her husband AC and their children, and their families. Miss Prather is still in ICU on the ventilator and she's really sick lately. And we want to lift this whole family up. Now I do have a praise report by Miss Prather's great grandson, Alec. Alec Quarles. Alec had to have an emergency appendectomy, but he is doing a lot better and just thankful for that. And want to continue to remember Janet Harkey and the entire Harkey family. It, Friday was the two month anniversary of Alan's. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, duck season in South Carolina. It is marked two months since he's passed away, and they're struggling. Like anyone would be, um, Alan was just such an amazing person in so many ways. And his life touched a lot of people, including the folks here at Genesis Church. Now, next Sunday, we are going to be meeting in person at Gethsemane Church, which is located at 5010 Highway 25 North, Hodges, South Carolina. And I'm terrible with directions. But we'll have, I'll be posting something about it every day next week on Facebook. The Gethsemane Church families opened up their facilities to us. Pastor Mark Lowe, Pastor Keith Fields, Pastor Damian Moraney, Pastor Wilson, and their entire board and family opened up their facility to us. And we are just so thankful. And uh, if you like to sleep in, that's okay. We do too. And it's going to be from 2 to 3 every Sunday. And even when I have to go to Boston, we're gonna we have that figured out too. So we're gonna be meeting in person unless something happens from here on out. And I just encourage you just to 
keep praying about our church and our, and by church I mean the people but keep praying about where God's wanting us to meet at and more importantly how we can touch people's lives we can have the nicest building but if we ain't touching folks lives that need Jesus we ain't doing what we're supposed to do so just be praying about for God to make us into the church family he wants us to be and that's spiritually first then physically and financially second and we have really been blessed but just pray that God will help us get out in, the, in our communities more in our workplaces more in our schools more that we'll raise up folks that can tell other people about Jesus and those plans are coming and we're doing it we start with real life and um, anyway let's see now you just sleep in rest up eat your Sunday dinner and then come on to church and worship with us. We invite you to invite people. This time frame is perfect for young families. That maybe they're working all through the week. And on Saturday they're trying to play catch up. And they have one day of sleeping early. And they're having to decide between going to church or sleeping in. Now they don't have to decide. And we have children, we're going to have our children's church back. And we're going to have a nursery. Please, invite folks. If you like what you hear here and you feel at home with us as a as a church family, come on. And anyone that's been thinking about giving their life over to Jesus, being baptized, we have a there's a baptismal pool there. And we are and you just bring your towel. We'll dunk you in a heartbeat. And we're just so just so thankful and so excited about this next chapter. Okay, well now on to our message. This week was a busy week. Uh, some of you know, I, we went to Pigeon Forge for a couple of days to celebrate my 50th birthday and squeezed in as much as we could. I continue checking on folks and praying with them as they're going through physical, emotional, and financial tough times this week. That's like an everyday thing for me and I'm blessed to be able to do I went back to work Thursday and had about two or three hundred emails waiting on me. Um, Thursday evening, Lisa and I had to attend a mandatory ministry meeting. Some of you may not realize this. I'm going through the ordination process. I should be everything well and ordained in July at our district assembly, but that's a long process. And there are psychological uh, evaluations and ministry assessments and all this other stuff you have to go through. And it's almost with every denomination. And we've gone through part of it and they ain't keep us out yet. And then Friday, we went down and had uh, Lisa and I both interviewed with the ministry board for the South Carolina district. And they went well. Well, a lot of a lot of stuff. And that's on top of the regular everyday life things. Cooking supper and washing and everything that Lisa and I do. A lot of that's Lisa, but I take a little bit of credit for it. I do cook. Anyway, hadn't heard from the Holy Spirit what to talk about this morning. And I was in front of my laptop on Saturday and I started looking at everything I did through the week and I knew the Holy Spirit had to be telling me something. And I just wasn't hearing it. As I went through everything I did, I realized I was being shown what to speak to you about. The thing is, the lesson in the hectic week I had and how I handled it at times. And there were times I handled it just fine, juggled everything. And then there were times I became real focused on the small things. Real focused instead of the moments I've been given. Turn 50. Got a lot of people in the obituaries I wish they had. Had my family here in the boat and they're healthy. A lot of folks would really wish for that. I, there were things that I had, I wish I'd done a little differently. And as I started looking at scripture, this section we're going to look at jumped out at me. Now, don't think I'm the only one. It might be focusing on the wrong thing sometimes. If you have your Bibles, please turn to John chapter 12. That's John chapter 12. And the characters in this chapter all remind me of people I've come across before or actually have felt, I feel like I've been them before as far as their attitudes and their motivations. Verse 1, Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. 
Bethany is about two miles from Jerusalem, and he left the Galilee area for the last time. Jesus was coming to the last weeks of his life. In Luke 9, 51, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resoundly set out for Jerusalem. He knew his time was coming short, and this was the day before Jesus made his entry into Jerusalem. He'd be put on the cross in less than a week. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving, but Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Now Martha was a doer. She used her work as a way of showing love, and we do that. I, I do that with cooking. I didn't realize it for years, but a lot of times that's how I show love, by cooking. Sometimes she'd get aggravated when others didn't do the same, and got wrapped up in so many small things and missed the big things in life. In Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42, Luke does a really good job of explaining what's happening here. And Jesus and his disciples, and same narrative there, sitting down for supper, and then Mary, Martha's sister, sitting at Jesus' feet, just listening to everything he said. Martha is just running from place to place, comes in, finds Mary sitting there. Well, and she started asking Jesus in verse 40, Lord, why don't you, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. And Jesus in verse 41 says, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are upset and worried about so many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. Do you know someone who gets so busy doing stuff that they lose sight of why they're doing it? I've been one of those people that have gotten so busy in the details I lost sight of why I was doing it and what the main goal was. Now Martha loved Jesus, but I don't think she understood what was getting ready to happen to him or she didn't want to deal with it. Sometimes people get involved in their work and what they do to avoid dealing with emotions they don't want to deal with. And they don't go away. Just the result is Martha was really full of frustration, bitterness, and complaining. And I think we all get like that sometimes. We get so busy with life that we forget this is only part of our journey. We don't prepare for the afterlife, our place in eternity. And our life can be gone in the blink of an eye. Eternity is forever. The Bible doesn't say it, but I imagine Lazarus had a totally different view on life after his resurrection. Church tradition and some church historians believe that Lazarus met Paul and Barnabas as they were traveling from Salamis to Paphos in Greece where he was supposed to be ordained as the Bishop of Kidion. Lazarus was raised from the dead by Jesus. And then he went on to serve others in the name of Jesus. And our sin nature that we all walk around with is a form of death, spiritual death. Addictions can be life-destroying. With Jesus Christ, people can overcome so much. And when you think it is impossible, think of Lazarus. Jesus raised him from the dead. Jesus loved him. He loves us. Now in verse 3, of chapter 12 of John. Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his head, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now, this is an extract made from a very rare plant that's only found in the Himalayan mountains. That's over near India and in China. It made its way all the way over here to Jerusalem. Very expensive, very hard to get. And you think about why. Why would Mary do that? No more than this, she put Jesus first. She understood who and what Jesus was. And Mary was motivated by devotion and sacrifice for the Savior. She had spiritual insight. She had ears and she listened. Mary gave Jesus a gift fit for a king because she knew he was one. And she anointed him like he was a priest because he's the head priest. She humbled herself before our Savior. She washed the feet of Jesus with her tears and dried his feet with her hair. 
How many people do we have in churches in the U.S. today who are more like Martha than Mary? Mary was busy listening to Jesus' words and understanding who he was, while Martha was too busy doing stuff. And I think there was some pride involved there as well. Mary humbled herself. Martha's pride wouldn't allow it. Verse 4, But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples who was intending to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to poor people? I think the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees wish more people would talk about Judas and take the heat off them. Jesus was chosen by God, by Jesus himself, like the rest of his disciples. He traveled with them. He was given the power to heal and exercise demons. He saw the miracles. Lazarus, the loads, the transfigurations, the blind being able to see and leprosy being cured. Despite it all, Judas dismayed, betrayed Jesus. It was known before Judas was ever born. David wrote in Psalm 41, 9, even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, is lifted up his heel against me. Zechariah 11, verse 30. Then the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, the lordly price, which I was priced by them. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. Have you ever had a Judas in your life? Someone you love is family. Someone who thought was family. You took them in, you showed them forgiveness and grace, and they betrayed you and attacked you. And it's hurtful. Oh, it's very hurtful. Sometimes these people help you to get where you need to be at spiritually, even though they don't mean to. Iron sharpens iron. Sometimes we're refined through the fires of what we go through. We learn what not to do through their actions, or their actions put us right where we are supposed to be at. Judas was part of the plan for Jesus' life. Much as Joseph told his brothers who had sold him into slavery in Genesis 20, 50, 20, As far as you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Now, 300 denarii would be about $20,000 in today's money. Jews and disciples turned the issue away from Christ on the poor. Do you think Jesus, Judas was disappointed because the poor one received the money? His heart was like stone. He was greedy and jealous. Mary's gift and Judas's reaction remind me a little bit of Cain and Abel. One gave their best, the other one got mad over it. In verse 6, find out the real reason why. Judas carried the money box and he helped himself to it. That was the real motivation for Judas, greed and jealousy. Jesus had already predicted his death to his disciples multiple times. The money and power were more important to Judas than Jesus, even after everything he witnessed. You think about that. Judas had the best spiritual instructor ever, 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 ever. And he still turned out the way he did. So many people have chance after chance after chance, and they have it handed to them. Then they turn around and they sting the person who gave it to them. How many people do we know we can say that about today? In verse 7, Jesus, therefore Jesus said, Let her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. I think Mary knew that Jesus was going to die when he went to Jerusalem. She took advantage of that opportunity to serve Jesus in the way that she could. God don't ask us to do any more what we're able to do. He asked us to help, to let him make us capable of doing what he has planned for us. She did what she did out of insight and devotion. Jewish burial customs called for the body to be packed down with myrrh and aloe and other fragrances. As I read that, I thought about it, it as real ironic. Myrrh was one of the gifts given by the wise men. I think it was a sign of things to come. And Mary started this process here. She knew that Christ deserved her best. How many of us can say that? There are times, and there have been times this week, Jesus got what was left instead of giving him my best. Psalm 16.10, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. The old Jewish, after it 
kind of like the early Jewish version of hell. Nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Jesus said in verse 8, For you will always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Jesus wasn't discounting the hard times of the poor. He came here for the underserved. He came here for those people without a voice. He came here for everybody. He was the unique son of God who was about to die for our sins. Be raised and go into heaven, leaving his disciples to proclaim the gospel. The biggest help for a beggar to millionaire, anywhere in between, is Jesus Christ. Without Christ, our societies will always degenerate and decay and eventually experience greater and greater social turmoil. If you don't believe me, just look outside. Look at what's happening in our country since we've gotten more open-minded and less spiritual. There are a lot of politicians saying that they should are concerned with the poor. And I think about G Judas is real concern. I think they have a lot in common. Greed and they both have betrayed the people that have voted them in. And that's on both sides of the aisle. I'm not picking sides on this. Verse 9, the large crowd of Jews then learned that he was there and the king, not for Jesus' sake only, but they might also see Lazarus whom he raised from the dead. These are the people, and they're trying to tear down the doors to get to Jesus to touch him and see Lazarus. And one week, these same people will be calling for his death while shouting for a criminal to be released. And their minds will be changed by a small group of elite know-it-alls. They didn't come for Jesus' words and his teachings. They came to see Lazarus and the person who raised him from the dead. They wanted to be close to him, but their hearts were far away from him. But the chief priest planned to put Lazarus to death also. The Jewish ruling class, religious class, were watching all this, and they were threatened by Jesus and his message. There are still people in authority threatened by Jesus and his message. They wanted to destroy him and any symbol of him. Lazarus was a symbol. They were experts on God's word in the synagogue every, and temple every time the door opened, but they were so far away from the will of God. We can be close to the word physically, involved in religious activities and works, but be very, very far away spiritually. We can be in the church, but lost. People of faith can become targets of others who put their trust in power and money. Caiaphas, the chief Pharisee, tried to use the Romans as an excuse for the murder of Jesus. It wasn't that. Because on the count of him, verse 11, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. They were jealous. Their control was being threatened. How much this whole world, how much pain and destruction is being brought about from control and jealousy and greed. Lazarus was one of the living, breathing examples of Jesus' ministry. And people who proclaim Jesus as their Lord and Savior and really live for the Lord make evil people nervous. A lot of times they're viewed with disgust and hatred. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, Indeed, all who desire to live in a godly life in Christ, Jesus will be persecuted. The Pharisees originated over 500 years before Jesus was born. Through all that time, they predicted the Messiah would come. However, he was supposed to be their idea of a Messiah. Didn't accept Gentiles, those folks like you and me. Didn't talk to sinners and kept every Jewish law. The Pharisees supposedly kept the laws, but they wanted to kill innocent men. And they searched for ways to kill Jesus. They used one of his hand-picked disciples to trap him, or so they thought. Jesus died because of the sins of the Pharisees. The sins of those who came before them and after them, you and me. They thought they were trapping Jesus destroying him. C.S. Lewis wrote, you will certainly carry out God's purpose, but it makes a difference whether you serve like Judas or like John. As we come to a close, ask yourself, who would I be in this story? Martha, so busy with putting life's, with life's work, putting everything ahead of Jesus. That was kind of who I was more this week. Judas, on the outside, concerned for the poor and someone's best friend, while on the inside suffering from greed and jealousy and anger. Haven't we all been Judas at some point? Our jealousy and our greed and our anger got the best of us. Lazarus, 
Newly born. A walking symbol of Christ's love. Or maybe we're threatened by people because Jesus is, maybe we're being threatened by people because Jesus has changed our lives and we're showing it. But I know I've quoted this before. You can't shack up with the devil and expect God to, put, to pay you rent. When you're changed and you move on to people that are threatened by you, people that persecute you, they're going to, when you're changed, they're not going to understand. Maybe the Pharisees. Looking and talking the part of the perfect religious person mind on the inside, broken. Have we been kind of like that before? Henry and Henry had a holy roller. Where we have, just look at them. Wow. Haven't we all kind of been like that at some point in time? And we stop and take a look and realize we're doing as bad or worse than they were doing. How many of us are like Mary? Living for Jesus and using what she was gifted with for Jesus and his kingdom. Not when it was convenient, but when it was called. Jesus doesn't want perfection from us. He wants us to listen to him through the Holy Spirit. To use the gifts we're given for his kingdom. We all have gifts we can use. It's a cop out if you think you don't. You do. And think about it. Remember, each step that Jesus took in his earthly life was a step towards the cross and a step for our salvation that we couldn't earn or buy. So as we go out throughout our week and the details start to bog us down, and they do all of us, and this won't be the last time it happens with me, just remember why are we here? Our God, our family, and everything else. Our God directs us towards our family. Our family directs everything else. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer. Father, we have all been, every person in this story, we've been to Judas and the Pharisees, threatened and filled with greed and anger. We've been Martha, so busy with everything in life, trying to do stuff for you, or we say we're doing it for you, but are we doing it more for you or for ourselves? And we get frustrated when we see other people that aren't doing what we think they're supposed to be doing. Are they doing wrong? Or are we? We've all been married, lined up, doing what you have asked us to do with the gifts you've given us. And it's hard to be merry all the time. It's hard to be Lazarus, the reborn, when we accept you as our Lord and Savior. We're given a new life and a new heart. It's hard to keep it. The sin nature is still inside of us, battling to come out. Father, lift us all up to you. Help us, Father be the people you want us to be and to use what we've been given, Father, for your kingdom. Just one person, Father. Just one person. If we can touch one person, each of us, Father, and then they touch someone. They touch someone. It's like little candles out in the darkness, one lighting off of another. Given enough, enough candles lighting enough candles, the room will burn brightly. Help us, Father, to be a church family that's burning brightly for you and lighting more candles in the darkness and bringing more people to Jesus, making more Lazaruses raised from the spiritually dead. Help us not get lost in the details that the enemy throws at us. You meet our needs. Help us to set the priorities of our lives in order they're supposed to be and for each one of us, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Y'all, our benediction is from Romans chapter 15, verses 5 and 6. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I just encourage you to, we're still going to continue the Facebook services, but if you're not doing anything, you want to try a new church home, if you're not going to church anywhere regularly, or maybe you want a little break. And you want to double time it. 
That is fine. We will be at Gethsemane Church, Hodges, South Carolina, starting next Sunday, May 2nd, 2 to 3 p.m. We have modern Christian music. It's karaoke style. Uh, you can't really select your own stuff, but the words are up there. We're laid back. What I'm wearing right now is like our normal dress. We're more concerned with your heart than what you got on your back, and you're more than welcome. And if you like this message, please share it on Facebook and write a little something about it. Because we just want to bring people to Jesus. We want to help people find Jesus. And we just want to, we don't want anybody going to hell. Love y'all. Hope you have a great week.